Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Old Cowtown Museum to our winter lecture series. Uh, we normally offer these on the second and fourth Sunday afternoons, but we're a little bit off this first time just getting things around. Uh, we hope to have these in person probably toward March. Um, so we're thinking probably February, the ones that will be on the 14th and the, and the 28th will probably be on, on uh, uh, virtual like we're doing today. So I may be getting just a little bit ahead of myself. Um, we are using a uh, Zoom webinar and this particular system, you as a participant um, or as, as an audience, you don't have the possibility of using the video or the uh, audio. And so there is a button for chat. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and, and send them to me. I'll be monitoring those while Keith is doing uh, his presentation. It also has a raise hand feature, and uh, I'll be looking that as that as well, uh, if you want to use that. It does have a question bar, but at this point, I'm not quite ready to, ready to use that yet. It's been quite an interesting learning event for, <laughs> for me for the last couple of weeks, learning how to use all this. So anyways, uh, so today we're going to be talking about the Wichita's Unholy Trinity Vice in the peerless princess of the plains. Uh, next week, Keith is going to do a lecture on the German influences here in Wichita. And then on the 14th, gonna be a presentation on Courier and Ives, uh, defining and reflecting American culture. And then the last three lectures, since we really didn't get a chance to properly introduce our new area, the becoming Wichita area, uh, we're gonna spend three Sundays on that. Uh, one talking about why Wichita came to be and some of the, the founders who were here, uh, Mead and Greifenstein and people like that. Um, and then we'll spend the next two uh, Sundays talking about the Native Americans who were local and inhabitant, as well as the last week of Sunday, we'll talk about the Native Americans who were on the plains. So I think it'll be a, a pretty good time altogether. Um, again, if you have any questions that you are curious about or anything that you'd like to let me know, uh, go ahead and, and send that to me in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll respond as appropriately. So, so without any further, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here and let Keith do his presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and slide the camera over so that you are just watching the PowerPoint portion. Uh, Keith will be the, the unembodied voice that's telling you the uh, program. So uh, enjoy and thanks a lot again for participating. Welcome, uh, Wichita 18 stage is no different than the other Western towns scattered on the map that developed around the cattle trade and farming. While many prominent businessmen and women struck their claim along the Arkansas River, other businesses prospered around less than admirable cravings. The businesses existed that centered on such vices as gambling, alcohol, and prostitution. These establishments sprinkled in the city landscapes along the doctor's offices, general stores, and banks. While some of them tried to keep a low profile, others flaunted their excitements to the population with those hopes of gaining clientele. The February 25th, 1897 Gerard Press came up with the saying unholy trinity to describe saloons, brothels, and gambling dens. Um, this quote I feel fits perfectly to Wich Wich Wichita's bias as well as Gerard's. So that's the reason why the title is Wichita's unholy trinity. But before 1872, when the railroad came into Wichita, Wichita still had vice. Uh, early dance halls and saloons were supported by soldiers, not cowboys. One of the first items during the first Board of County Commissioners meetings was to, it was issuing a, a license to sell liquor. At Camp Beecher, discipline was almost non-existent. Camp Beecher was north was north of Wichita, near near 13th and Jackson near about 13th and Jackson Street. 
It's only a civilian employee, camp physician, Dr. E.G. Umpsatter, had lost his contract because he was habitually under the influence of intoxicating drink. I was using for his private drinking most of the hospital brandy and whiskey. The enlisted man did not believe that they, they, they didn't behave any differently. Due to this, the army officials felt that keeping the soldiers at the post might be more dangerous than an Indian raid. Thus, Camp Beach was abandoned forever on June 3rd, 1869, after only about two years in existence, without finding any, without having any, without finding very little in Indians to, to attack or control. Which will pass ordinance number two on July 25th, 1870, that pertained to the selling of liquor. They, which also claimed all of the vice was wet and was in West Wichita, which is now known as Delano. That way, Wichita could deny any law, unlawfulness for plague the city itself, which was not as true, which is very, which was very misleading. Here is an image of Wichita City Orange number two from the August 25th, 1870 Wichita by debt. It's very hard to read, so I actually typed up what it said. That, without, that section one is that whenever any person who desires to obtain a license for a dram shop, a grocery, or a tavern shall pay to the treasurer of the town $75. It shall be the duty of the clerk to issue him a license to sell intoxicating liquors in less quantities than a quart at a time for a period of three months from the date thereof. So they basically, they, they got a quart about every month. Section two pertain more to what would happen if you didn't, if you didn't, if you violated the law. So apparently you paid seventy-five dollars to get the license, and if you didn't get the license, you got a seventy-five dollar fine. Pretty easy bookkeeping. The main factor in Wichita's vice was the cattle trade. And it came via the, the Chisholm Trail, originally known as Chisholm's Trail and many other names. The trail followed Chisholm's freight route. It was named after Jesse Chisholm, and marked by Joseph McCoy from Abilene to the Kansas Oklahoma border. I first heard of cattle on the trail in 1867. Jesse Chisholm never heard of cattle up the Chisholm Trail. And at first, and then it ended about 1885, after passing the state quarantine law, which basically moved the quarantine line west. Any cow that came up from Texas could not go east of this line due to a thing called Texas fever, which was a tick that spread disease to domestic cattle. Texas cattle were immune to it, but Kansas cattle were not. Here is a map, I suppose they claim the 1870 map, it's actually a more modern map of Chisholm Trail. Showing all the branches of the Chisholm Trail up. Went up to Ellsworth. And to the east you actually have Kansas, in there, Kansas' first cow town, which is Baxter Springs. To become the main Kansas cattle trail, uh, cattle town, Wichita needed five things to happen. Changing the state quarantine laws, which allowed allow the cow to come up, spend huge sums of money to make the city more attractive to cattle drovers than other southern Kansas cow towns on the cattle trail, such as Caldwell and Newton. Attract a railroad to ship the cattle. And then also convince the majority of rural uh, buyers to come to Wichita, and also convince the majority of rural and urban populations to support, to put up with the effects of the cattle trade. So they paid farmers and your cattle got killed. They, the city would pay you so much money to replace for your dead cattle.
In 1872-71, Wichita was going to be bypassed with the from the cow trades. So four Wichitans decided to go try and get cow to birth the cow trade to Wichita instead of instead of neighboring Park City. This is for N.A. English, James R. Mead, Mike Mahar, and James M. Steele. N.A. English operated a successful real estate loan and investment firm. James R. Mead was one of Wichita's founders. Mike Mahar was Wichita's first city marshal. And James M. Steele was, all, was real estate insurance and loan agent. They all combined to do it. So they heard the cattle were heading towards Park City and aborting Wichita. The Park City we're talking about is the one near Mays, north of Mays, not the one, the, not the current Park City. Heard the cattle heading, and so they rode out to meet the first herd out west of town. They caught up to the herd shortly before sunup. After offering a handsome consideration, the cattle headed to Wichita. They bribed the cowboys to bring the cattle to Wichita. As James R. Mead wrote, Taking the leader of the cowmen to one side, we used an argument in the way of a handsome consideration, which proved more potent than words. The word of command was given, the great herds of cattle swung around to the right and headed for Wichita, leaving Shanklin alone on the prairie with his, with his sable John. In due time, we arrived in town triumphant and exalted, and the drovers literally had, literally had the freedom of the city. For the, for, for the five years that Wichita was the, the head of the cow trade, this is how many cattle were shipped out. As you can see, the numbers declined per year. 1874, they had a big, win, a deadly, 1874, 1875, there's a, there a big deadly winter. So that's the reason why you see a lot of drops in it. Plus also by this time, Ellsworth was taking a lot of it, a lot of the cattle away from Wichita. And in 1877, the cow line was moved west of Comanche County. And that ended Wishaw's cow trip, years as a cow trip. Fines for, for advice were applied on both sides of the river. Contrary to popular belief, Delano was not a, was not one, was not, was not an un, unfindable fences in it. So they had it on both things. County Commission notes no note no, a lot of saloon owners in Delano actually paid dram shop licenses. From 1872 to 1877, which had no taxes, all the city's expenses were covered by the effects of the cow trade. Thus, the city tolerated the cow trade. The second order of business during the July 1st, 1872 Cedric County Board of County Commission's meeting was to grant a license to Rowdy Joe Lowe in, in West Wichita, which we will be discussing later on. First order of bias we've talked about saloons. During the, during the cattle area, saloons were an acceptable part of Wichita society. They brought in, they catered to the immigrant immigrants, but they also were tolerated. They were acceptable, so far. Um, they paid $25 a month. Saloons also served as meeting places for city leaders. Also, buff saloons were also where a lot of your school children went, went to school, because Wichita had a tendency not want to pay for schools. Marshall Murdoch is famous for saying, don't waste city money on schools. Instead, spend it on, visit, on the cow trade or trade bring it in. By 1873, which had 15 saloons. And by the end of the cow trade, I think I saw read that there's at least 25, 30. Bowling alleys and billiard rolls also had attached to them saloons. Anything to get people to come in and get money. This article from the New York, New York Daily Advertiser kind of summarizes the saloon in Wichita. The business street is about a mile in length, is lined with grocery saloons, dry goods saloons, hardware saloons, furniture saloons, and then a few more saloons. One naturally infers that these drovers are very dry people, or 
or else the water is unpalatable or very unhealthy. But the water, as we testified from personal experience, was palatable, healthy, and exceedingly abundant. So according to the New York Daily Advertiser, which I had a lot of saloons. This is one of my favorite articles I found on anything vice. It talks about how to be a nobody, because if you went to the saloons and gambling dens and even the house of Bill repute, you were kind of looked on as a nobody to the elite which ran the newspapers and the banks. So this is kind of it. I won't read the whole thing. I'll, I'll keep it on the slide for a while. That way people can read it. Apparently, dime novels of the day were basically kind of the, the lowbrow of, of the novels to read. So you want to be reading Charles Dickens or any of the classic novels. You're reading the dime the dime novels, which were kind of geared more towards the more towards the less educated, more general public. So pretty much anything fun, you you could be a nobody. Plenty of time to read it. If anybody, had, if anybody wants to see these slides again, just say so, and I can go back to them at the end of the presentation. But probably the most famous of all the saloon owners in Wichita was Fritz Snessler. Came to Wichita in 1971. He was one of the largest men in Kansas, weighing as much as 358 pounds. Set on a claim eight miles south of Wichita on the Cascade Creek, he came to Wichita to be a farmer. He simplifies his name to Snitzel in the 1970s, even though over the years it, 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 he kept the S at CH or he took there he took out the at, at CH. It depended on what venue he was using. He started out owning a restaurant in 1875. He got tired of farming, so he decided to get in the restaurant business. In 1876, Snitzler established a larger complex they called Snitzville, which included a hotel, a restaurant, a mill meat, meat market, and a saloon. The Wichita City Directory, this is a description of Fritz Snitzler. It says, Fritz Snitzler is the proprietor of a restaurant in Wichita. We will not attempt to describe his place, which doesn't help later historians because we don't really know what his place looked like. I'll tell who he is or from whence he came. Everybody knows Fritz, and whoever visited Wichita know him. Mr. Snitzer will hold down over 200 pounds as fully as liberal and jolly as he is heavy. It is worthwhile to look into his restaurant about 12 o'clock and see the throng that gathered around his tables. He has two large dining halls and frequently from 100 to 150 dine with him. Fritz knows how to run a restaurant and never allows his guests to go away dissatisfied. When you go to Wichita, take your dinner there. So Snitzer wasn't just your typical Hollywood saloon. He had more than just liquor. He, he fed people. He did other things in his saloon. He gave, he gave lunches. A lot of your saloons gave out free lunches. And also, and a lot of times they were very, they were very salty. That way you would have to buy beer or liquor to calm down and drink down to get rid of the salty taste of the food. This is a view of 100 block East Douglas, the complex known as Snitzville. Two of the buildings at, here at Old Cowtown Museum were modeled after, the, after this photo. Feckheimer clothing store. You're basically looking at present, this would be where we were present, uh, present day northeast corner of D Douglas and Market would be. The Great Western Re Restaurant ran by uh, Ed Knobloch, who was this, a, a son to Snitzler's stepdaughter, or wife to, or, no, sorry, husband to Snitzler's stepdaughter. Snitzler's Apollo Saloon. And then over here you have the Boozy and Cronut Cigar Manufacturer, 
which was in the second story above the Douglas Avenue Bakery, which is what the stone the brick building over here is on the right. And to the left of the Im Im image is the Keystone Clothing House, the predecessor to the Bidding Brothers store, which is what was an early, major early clothing store in Wichita. It's where the Bidding Block is now. Here's an ad from the 1878 city directory. Fred Snitzler was Fred Snitzler's son. So he says Fred down there. Notice how he's adding, it does not have a CH. I think it depended on what, how he's advertising. By this time, he also had a hotel. So you could come in and yeah, he had a stable, you can eat, you put your horses in, he even had cattle. So he had a big, big complex. And then he's talking about gambling. That's the second vice that we'll be talking about. Gaming houses paid a monthly city license of $50 and up. Most popular games are Keno and Pharaoh. Kino is a bingo game, and Pharaoh is a card game played with one deck of cards and amidst any number of players. Gaming houses are not considered any more seedy than saloons, but they were a lot less seedy than um, they were a lot less seedy than the third level we're going to talk about was prostitution. Passes with anti-gambling laws closed down the houses in Wichita and moved them across the river. But at the end of the cattle trade, they moved back across, back to the east side of the river. Kino Corner was probably the most famous of all the gambling houses. It was located in the northwest corner of Maine and Douglas, basically where Interest Bank's main offices are now. It's operated by W.W. W. Rupp. Had one room upstairs devoted to Chuckaluck. Also called cage dice, which gives the better a chance to guess the number rolled up to three dice. Pharaoh, Monty, Poker, and Roulette. The roulette apparent table made of 25 to 80 feet. The room was used by people who played for real money, not compared to the fake money, apparently, that some of the other gambling houses were allowed. Downstairs was a saloon and a room made of 50 by 70 feet, where a keynote was played from 7 p.m. to noon. 12 p.m. And according to the Eagle, this room was where the humble creatures haunted the corner. At midnight, a lunch was spread to all who saw fit to attend. There's a legend that this daily midnight lunch, lunch cost rough $100, which is almost is over $2,100 in today's money. But it paid for you, you would have quit. He made all his money on gambling. There's, so he could offer he could offer a free lunch. That free lunch enticed the people to come and spend the money in his gambling. Yeah. There's also a there was also a legend that supposedly that they went from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next day. Hence the term of lunch at at, at midnight. Next, we're talking about the third vice, which is probably the most, uh, probably the most seedy and probably what mo most people think of the of the Old West, the prostitution. Prostitution in the West had many different names, such as painted cats, fair but frail, scarlet letters, fallen angels, and so on. Other names include giddy ladies, come on girls, easy women, fast women, fancy women. Bell Bells and Fair Owls. The Wichita newspapers kind of narrowed it down a little bit. They used Demi Mons, Girls of Period, Nymph Du Paid, Soiled Doves, Sporting Women, and Women of the Town. Nowhere in the 1870s, in any 1870s Wichita newspapers, the name prostitute used to describe a woman, woman or man that, that portrayed in the, in the Oldest profession. Now, there's a lot of mention of prostitute when you're the verb, but nothing for the for the people. So, 
So it doesn't wish lady that worked alone or worked in a brothel for a madam. In West Wichita, they, they worked in dance halls. The Maddens gave them room, room board protection. The doves in town worked for the Madden and retained part of the service charges. Brothels usually were opulent places of basic entertainment. You didn't, there was very, there's very little saloons in them, especially on the east side of town. The same fines are applied to saloons and gambling houses. Maybe same fines are eight dollars plus two dollars court costs for prostitutes, and eighteen dollars plus two dollars court costs for keepers or the maggots. So you'd find the owners of the of the brothel or the prostitution house more than you would the workers. And during the winter months, since the cow trade wasn't coming in, fines were lowered for for for, for those ones, almost split in half. Now, if, if they were, if some of those are ill or and unable to work, they weren't fined. In 1876, the fines were dropped to half or three dollars plus two dollars court costs for the prostitute, eight dollars plus a two dollar court cost for keepers. That was because the cow trade was, was dying off. They were also fined for vagrancy, enticing prostitution, or carrying concealed weapons. If the citizens being fined thought the fines were too high, they went over the river where, where very little fines were applied. Thousands of dollars were obtained beside the further interest of the town. I think, I, I think of when I did a basic research thing for the year 1873, I found there was at least 45 prostitutes in Wichita on the east side of the river, madams and the prostitutes. So you had a lot of money com coming in. And, this, and they were fined every month. Here is a sample of the September 1872 city marshal's report. Here is Ida May, who's a famous uh, uh, brothel owner. Notice her fine is $20, which means she's the keeper, and then $10 for four, for four, four soil doves. Maggie Marshall, Kendall Maude Howard, and Maggie Snyder, and Alice something. I can't read the last name on that. A lot of your names, you look, these aren't the original names for the people. For the girls that were also guys are fine too. So these weren't the original, the, especially of the soil doves. Those weren't their, their original names. A lot of them had Maggie, Alice, Mary, Kate, Kent, were a lot of the famous names for, for, for soil doves. And they weren't really their, their original names at birth. Again, you have Sally. Sally Namadu, Emma Thompson, Georgia Dow, Jesse Lee, and Kate Mason. These are a little easier to read. Sally Namadu is the madam. These are her four sort of does that worked under her. And here's the here's the other other half of the of the Marshall Report. Showing, showing the other soil does with, with, with the battle. George, Georgia Williams is on the top. And then, and then uh, 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 later, we'll be talking about later, Josephine Demerit. She comes very handy in the Delano talk, talk which we will talk about at the end. Now they wasn't just all pertaining to uh, paying for what paying for relations. They also had entertainment. It was very limited. Most of it was basically most of the time they're basically going downtown to shop. And pro and soil dove would dress as fancy as your as your church going lady. During the winter month, one month soil doves would go downtown to shop. Horse racing became very, a very, very lively entertainment for the men and the soil doves. You take your soil doves out to racetracks. And, but then some of them even made their own entertainment. 
During the night, 1875, one soiled dove walked in the city streets only in nature's vestments, which meant she was basically in a birthday suit. Another got her guzzle full of whiskey and with a fast train team drove single headed handed up and down Main Street, swearing and howling like a wolf. But this is also another one that my, this is one that they did on the, uh, one of the racetracks. And apparently some soil does decide to make some of the own entertainment at the racetrack. This is what happened. According to the Eagle. Now you gotta take a lot of faith with the Eagle. You gotta take a lot of this with some, with some doubt because the Eagle liked to pay, pay anything that wasn't moral in their eyes. Very, very evil, bad life. This is especially true when you get to West Wichita. I like the quote of burning brains and eyes staring from their sockets. Which are basically talking about the soil doves, the two soil doves fighting. I have not found that any fines were assessed for, for this fight. And the Eagle apparently did not do a follow up story on that. Not everyone was pleased by the entertainment that the Soil Dove provided. This is from the Wishaw Weekly Beacon, August 13, 1873. The decent people of the city begin to think about time our police pay some attention to restricting the unbridled license permitted to fill the joys and insult decency nightly upon our thoroughfares. The thing has gone far enough, we hereby announce that it is the determination of certain citizens that it will be stopped forthwith or trouble will begin. Unfortunately, it never stopped. Even after the cow train left. Like I said, Ida May was one of the first soil does in Wichita to arrive in 1870. No real evidence that Ida May what was her real name. Bought one of the first two-story houses in Wichita, Pine and Main. It later became a Masonic Lodge. Charged with chemo body house in 1871. One of the defense witnesses was Darius Munger, who built the Munger house. She was found gu not guilty by the jury. Munger's testimony was not sufficient cause to prove she was an unchaste woman. Must be proved the house of the body house and further prove that she set up and was the mistress of such body house of brothel. So Frank Munger was not persuaded with the evidence the prosecution had against Miss May. She was fined as a keeper of house prostitution as a prostitute from August 1872 until May 1877. Unfortunately, there is, I have not been able to find any record of her in Wichita after May 1877. She kind of fell off the map. Now, the Wichita Tribune apparently did not like the not guilty verdict. This item that has become so notorious throughout the state was brought before the district court this week. Although circumstantial evidence was such as to not admit of the doubt as to the correctness of the charge, if there was not enough positive proof in behalf of the state to convict the criminal and the jury, therefore gave a verdict of not guilty. Even though they believe the jury's evidence was correct according to the evidence, we willingly admit that, that corroborated the views of the people of Wichita was in accordance with their wishes. We seriously doubt. Now, probably uh, one of the most Famous of uh, them just because due to her brother in law was Nellie Bessie Earp. Came wish 1874 with her husband James and brother in law Wyatt. She ran a house of prostitution on North Water. She was fined as a prostitute from January 1874 until March 1875. Moved to Fort Worth, Texas in 1876 once the died out. And she actually arrived in Tombstone in, with James in 1879. And then she died, then died eight years later. 
Second one is Sarah Sally Haspel Earp. Born, uh, she met Wyatt Earp in Peoria, Illinois, around 1870. Claims she was Wyatt's wife, even though there's no marriage record. Both of them came to Wishland in 1874. She was arrested along with Bessie Earp on June 3rd, 1874, by a complaint by Samuel A. Martin. Here is the, 18, uh, the May 1874 fines list, and there's Bessie Earp and Sally Earp. 18, May 1874, they were just uh, soil doves, but later on they would actually find as keepers. Here is the complaint from Samuel A. Martin. Set up and keep a body house or brothel and did appear and act as a mistress and have the care and management of a certain one story frame building situated and located north of Douglas near the bridge. So, this is basically what his complaint was about Sally Earp's brothel. Aerial view of 1873, Wichita. And then actually right there's Bessie Sally's Bravo right there. That's where the Broadview Hotel is currently. The Drury Broadview Hotel. The river is right here. And the Doug Side Bridge goes right across. Here is she did get arrested. Since there's not a lot of stuff on Bessie and Sally, I do. This is one of the few. This, this is the, the arrest warrant dated June 30, 1874. Now we're going to talk about the section of town that everybody thinks all of the all the vice happened at is Delano. A lot of this stuff I have on here is actually what we talked about before. The major factor in getting West Wishaw's bad reputation was Wishaw itself. He wanted families to come to town and just say all the, all the bad stuff is across the river outside the city. That way people could come in. Rowdy right, Joe Lowe, probably the most famous of all of them. They, in 1871, Joe and his wife, Roddy Kate, moved to Newton. Set up a brothel in Delano to the west end of the Doves Avenue Bridge. During the cow trade, Lowe's dance hall was called the swiftiest joint in Kansas. Made more than $100 a night on drinks alone during the cattle season. This kind of tells you how Rye Joe kept order. This is probably the only positive thing written about Rye Joe in, in the in Wichita newspapers. Because later on he did something that put him in the legend. About in 1873, Edward Redbeard showed up in Wichita, built a saloon right beside Ryan Joe. But we, during this time, there, him and Lowe got, got kind of long. These are kind of the dimensions of the dance halls. Redbeard depended on Josephine DeMerritt and Walter and Carrie Beebe to run his business, while Lowe depended on his wife, Ryan Kate. Remember, Josephine DeBarrett was one that got fined for prostitution on the east side of the river. So now she's moving across the river. Not much of a thing. It's not fancy like Hollywood portraying portray saloons. Here's a view of, of, uh, of Delano from the 1873 aerial. The west of the river, Douglas Avenue was known as Chicago Avenue. That wasn't until 1905 when they changed that, that name. Here's Roddy, Roddy Joe's, here's Redbeard's. 
So they are very close to the river. Basically where the meridian is in McLean currently is where the, the dance halls were. Before 1870, about, about August of 1873, Red, Redbeard kicked, uh, shot some soldiers from a, uh, their camp north of town. They swore revenge and burned down his dance hall. So during this time, Roddy Joe became the sole, sole dance hall owner in West Wichita, or the most profitable. Redbeard got jealous, so he fires a shot at Roddy Joe. Lowe pulls his shotgun and starts firing at the ceiling. Yeah, I remember both these men were drunk at the time, so you kind of have to, they weren't the best shot. And probably not the most brilliant idea, Redbeard starts charging Lowe, stacking his gun, but does not go off. Rowdy Kate then pushes Rowdy Joe out the side door. This is a very short, truncated story of the fight. Redbeard fires his gun, actually shoots Annie Franklin in the stomach. Rowdy Joe returns to his saloon, reloads his shotgun, goes after Redbeard. Shortly after a shotgun blast, he reverberates through the night. Rowdy Joe shot Redbeard on the double side of the bridge. This all happened on August, October 27th, 1873. Rowdy Joe crosses the bridge and surrenders to the sheriff which was John Mahar. Redbeard lingered in agony until he died, until dying at, at, on Tuesday, November 11th. Ryan Joe's found not guilty, but unfortunately he's on, going to be tried on a, a charge of assault for continuing to kill Willie Anderson. Ryan Joe escapes because he knows he won't get off on the second charge. And then his, then Beard's partner, Josephine DeVere, forges her signature on a new deed for Beard's dance hall. And then they were all, then she was pardoned in 1876. Okay, Walter and Carol Beebe thought, hey, our, our boss is dead, we'll help Ryan Joe escape. Beard wasn't thought of too highly, he was a nice guy. So a lot of newspaper articles lamented that it's probably a good thing Low killed him. And Ryan Joe was fatally shot in the dinner saloon on February 11th, 1899. And just in case anybody knows, that, wants to know, this is Red, Redbeard's gravestone in Highland Cemetery here in Wichita. Just got a headstone this, this past year. For years, it's an unmarked grave. And my good friend in Colorado, he got me images of Joseph Lowe's grave in, in Denver. After the cattle trade, many of the vice left this wish on moved across the river. Right, just dance halls hauled out of West Wish of the country in 1875. Redbeard's dance hall was moved, was bought in 1874 and moved to Main Street to become a wagon shop. And on May 12, 1885, Wish Shop annexes West Wichita. William E. Stanley was elected county attorney in 1874, 1876, and 1878. In 1877, he wrote a letter to the city council demanding the city regulate, regulate or close brothels. Here is his letter. And just in case you know what it says, this is what it says. Now the city, you think the city and county didn't get along now. It's true of back then. This is what the city thought of the county of Stanley's order. Did 
They did not like the county meddling his business in, in, in the city affairs. Now, in 1877, the Oxford Independent wrote, the soul does wish to have see order leave the town. Monday was fixed as the day of their departure. If the order is obeyed, it will reduce the population of the city about 300. The, to which the eagle wrote, how do you know? It's probably, that's probably my second favorite article, all about all vice, just because of the eagle's response to it. And of course, the main thing that killed the vice or tried to end the vice was temperance. You can't talk about the beginning of vice without the end or the supposed end. Temperance rate reform was started in 1873. Moving into quarantine in 1876 brought about the second wave of reform. And temperance is really tied to the churches. And the churches tied to temperance to the economy and taxes. So they thought if you if they spend less money and the, they really kind of try to figure out a way to do it for the economy tax, in which the economy was all based on the fines and fees. But our buddy Fritz Snitzler believed that reformers do not consider the negative effect that Tim's would have on the local economy. My favorite is Cost, Harris, and others place bets in favor of passing a prohibition while drunk at Keno Corner. And eventually, the prohibition did happen in Kansas in 1880, but it was very rarely followed. Now, this is a quote. Many believe that this quote is actually about Delano in West Wichita, but unfortunately, it's actually about Tremont Street, which is South St. Francis. You know, from October 28th, 1909. So, Vice and Vice never left Wichita. That's why Carrie Nation attacked the, the hotel meeting. And Vice has existed in Wichita since the first settlement of the city in 1868. The arrival of the cow trade in say to propel Wichita's unholy trinity of Vice to legendary snacks. Are there any questions, Anthony? Are there any questions? Kind of hurried through a lot of this stuff, but I'm about 247, perfect. All right. If anybody has any questions, you can type them in, in the question bar on Zoom, and I will try and answer them the best I can. So this is Anthony Horsch again. Um, don't uh, see any questions coming in on the, the chat portion of things. Uh, it's kind of the unhandy part of not having an audience. Can't really respond very quickly. So um, in a day or so, you'll get an email from us uh, giving us any feedback that you have about um, our lecture today. Uh, again, uh, join us next week where we'll be doing a lecture on the effects of the German population on the city of Wichita. So we thank you for your kind attention. We hope you enjoyed yourselves and, and give us your feedback and, and we do appreciate it. Hope to see you again next week. Thanks.